talking with Elise Puyo. That's right. Who worked with Mai Zetterling from 1974 to 76, 77, approximately, and became a friend. Uh, can you describe for us, first off, your initial meeting with Mai and how you came to become her assistant? Um, 74, early 74. There was November 74, and it was two years before the Olympics, but two years after uh, she had done a film for the Munich Olympics, 72. And um, she had been uh, really uh, turned off by behind the scenes at the Olympics. She, the whole drug scene and the coaches, those were two main uh, nemesis. In her objections to the uh, athletic culture, what, what were they? When you say drugs and coaches, well, she she wanted to expose what was hidden, so and she like had a project of a film. Uh, with the national, the film board, L'Office National du Film was the French section. And she had a proposal called L'Envers de la Médaille, which would have been the other side of the medal. And she wanted to show what happens really with the coaches and the drugs, which has since then come out in the open. But at the time, it was best kept secret. So uh, she did a proposal and she came to Canada and I got a phone call the day before I was leaving for the winter. I always go away for the winter. And uh, I got a phone call asking me to put on hold my departure to meet my Zetterling and uh, be the researcher, la recherchiste, on, um, on her project. So I stayed, and uh, so we got to know each other, and, uh, and then the proposal and the answer took a long time. So she rented a house outside in the country, making sure that I wasn't going to leave, because I always wanted to go to Mexico for the winter. So she kept me uh, in that house, and, um, and uh, then the answer came that the National Film Board was the official filmmaker for the... Uh, for the Olympics. So they could not do the other side of so the So they medal. were the official broadcaster? They were the official broadcaster. Television. Well, maybe not broadcaster, but film makers. And, and this way you can't reveal the ugly side if you're the official one. So she, her project fell through. But then she started uh, trying to uh, lure me to go back to France with her as her assistant. So we were staying at a producer's house and, uh, and I used to do a lot of meditation. I was aiming towards becoming a meditation teacher, which I did eventually. And uh, so I was meditating every morning and then I'd come to the breakfast table and I would have a drawing of a ticket to France or the next morning would be pictures of Le Mas de Gavive, her property in France, or the dog, or the cat. So she was really showing me you know, how interesting it would be. And uh, so she, um, and I kept saying, I'm going to meditate on it. So she'd wait for me outside the meditation room. <laughs> and she, she'd wait outside and she said, so, you know, opening the door and she'd go, so? I said, well, nothing came yet. <laughs> And it took a few days, and one morning it came to me that I should accept that offer. Which, uh, and in a f question of days, we were on an airplane off to Nîmes. Wow. <laughs> so the um, film that she had done for the 1972 Olympics was called The Strongest and uh, it was part of a series called Visions of Eight, where they had solicited eight directors 
to that's make right. short films. That's the film, yes. And yeah. she got, she chose, which surprised me, she chose wrestling. The, she chose the, uh, the wrestling. And why did this surprise you? Well, I, um, I just didn't know her and I didn't know that she wanted to make a statement right from the start that it wasn't going to be synchronized swimming yeah. <laughs> with all the beautiful girls. <laughs> so, uh, Did you think it was incongruous? No, no, no. It, it just took me by surprise, but I loved it. I loved her statement and the way she, uh, she approached the, the topic too was very well done. And in what ways did you find she, she went through, you know, the whole training and the muscle bound and, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, she went through it. She, she, she made a very good picture of it. In detail. Including, very detailed. Including and, yeah. a cold storage locker where they prepared the sides of beef. Yeah, the and, and I being vegetarian and I think I was vegan at the time. And to see these huge masses of animals just rolling in on hooks and you know she she loved to to really bring it out you know bring it on <laughs> it, it was a, a film about obsession she said rather than sport she said to the press uh, yes. i don't like sport but i am very interested in obsession that's exactly it and that's that's the whole olympics it's happening at this time when we're talking uh, you can see how people give up a part of a life, a whole chunk of their lives for one second of glory, you know, just one gold medal. And the rest of the life is nothing but repetition and obsession and, and, uh, and pain and overcoming pain. And so she, she really brought that out. She, she really did it. Do you think she so, experienced something similar in her own life in terms of being a star? She experienced a lot of things in her own life and, uh, and she could relate to anything that brought pain, yes, she could relate very well. And I don't know how much um, she was trying to uh, erase those scars. Um, even my coming over, I came at, a, she always said, one of the most difficult parts of her uh, of her life because she didn't tell me though but her husband had contacted her in Canada David he to say he was leaving her David Hughes David Hughes the writer the British writer and she used to to write the scripts with him Le Girls was written with David and um, and he was a very successful author on his own and when we arrived, he picked us up at the airport, he dropped us off at Le Mas and left. It was one of the last times I saw him. I First and last time. Uh, so it was really hard for her because uh, everything she, you know, the whole Mas was a huge <coughs> enterprise by itself. The, the, the domain, the, the renovations, the home, the houses, the, uh, no electricity, no telephone, uh, you know, but she, all of a sudden she had all that on her little shoulders, you know, and I thought I was just going to be the assistant to my Zettling, but I turned out to, to be a farmhand and, uh, you know, anything, you know, the, the, the whole electricity was like, it was all gas and this huge bonbon that we had to pick up and change and... Uh, gas cylinders. <laughs> Full of gas, yeah. like propane. Propane, of. yes, and and um, and uh, but the most the most uh, difficult thing I found for myself was that I had the impression I was always living in a movie set. Uh, for her, everything was always arranged as a movie, and uh, the all the animals were white. The goats were Nubian goats, they were white. The cats were honey-eyed Scottish white cats. The dog was a white 
Irish wolfhound. Uh, ev you know, everything was white. And uh, so the inside of the house was the same thing. Everything was like a set. And uh, if I couldn't just come and put a glass of water like this, or even the book I was reading could not be put down on a side table or on a couch, because she would come and find a, a place, a hidden place that wouldn't be in the set. Uh -huh. Living there was living in a set. So. Uh, they had been there uh, for some time when you arrived, or a short time, or a long time? Uh, it must have been not what, I don't know how many years, but uh, it was like a ruin that they bought. and. It had started to be livable. It was a lot of renovations, a lot, and it was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Was it was a large home? It was, and it had another little house, which was the guest house, which I inhabited most of the time. And uh, uh, you, you came in, and there was this huge living room, and the second floor was books from, from floor to ceiling, on a mezzanine, which was again visible from below. Visible from below, yeah. And again, that was like uh, one of her dreams: books and uh, and seeing them in that. And the fireplace was about eight feet deep, and at least fifteen feet wide. But the most amazing thing is that we used to sit inside the fireplace. There was two cushions on each side of the fire, so the chimney was really in the middle. So we could, uh, you know, at night uh, she would go out and cut some rosemary twigs and prepare a tea, and then we would uh, we'd go and sit in the chimney and discuss what we had done during the day, which was doing research for projects. We had so many projects. Very few got realized, strangely enough, in the couple of years that I worked with her. But uh, they were fascinating. And uh, script writing, she had projects and we would write, we'd work on the script and we'd discuss the script and what, what we had done. And uh, so we'd be sitting inside the fireplace. With the fire. With the fire between the two of us. And Keeper, who was, you know, those Irish wolfhounds had their highest dogs. And Keeper uh, thought he was a lap dog. So he would come and just plunk himself on your lap, thinking he was a poodle. When it would have been more appropriate <laughs> for you to ride him. Exactly. When I used to go for the mail, which was three kilometers down the road, on a bicycle, he would gallop in, in the field, not on the road, in the field, next to me. And I always thought of him as one of the horses, of Camargue, you know, the south of France. Yes. They have those wild horses. Where she filmed uh, Lords of Little Egypt, the gypsy movie. That's right, yes. that's right. And uh, the wild horses. At Saint something de la Mer, uh, yeah. Yes, Saint something so, de la Mer. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so she, uh, so the whole house was, it was, uh, you know, she had put so much into it in all senses, and uh, all of a sudden she was alone, you know, doing. So, strangely enough, she, um, I guess it was her upbringing and, and, and the whole career thing for her was something she didn't like to look back on. As an actress, she much preferred to be in control and and the director, and uh, she um, she sort of pushed everything back. You know, she tried to not look upon her past uh, until I think she started to write her autobiography. Now tell us about some of the projects that you did work on initially with her, if, if you can remember any of them in <laughs> It's a long time ago. Well, there's one I cannot forget, was um, first we had, uh, 75 was Women's Year, and there was a women's film festival. And, uh, in France. In Paris. 
uh, so women filmmakers came from all over the world and she was the guest star because of Les Girls. So she, um, following that film festival where it was very interesting because she managed to communicate very well with the public and I would be translating on the stage with her, translating the questions from the audience and to her and then translating her answers to them and, and she, um, it was a very successful uh, Let me ask festival. You, uh, regarding the girls, she made that film in the mid '60s, and you're talking of 1975. And she complains or mentions in her autobiography that initially this film was not uh, embraced by a wide audience, and it, but it was only several years later, in the early mid '70s, that, yeah. that it was really that it came to be recognized. Did, did she ever comment on that? Yes, because um, maybe also something I wasn't totally aware of was what happened in uh, Sweden, because that's where it was best known. It came out in Swedish right. with the Swedish actresses. So, but before the concept of feminism, uh, of women's liberation came, uh, the film didn't find its niche, you know, it didn't, so, and then one day all of a sudden this, this women's movement is taking shape and they say, oh, this is what happened to the actresses who were on tour playing Lizzie Strata. The play started working on their minds and they started re-examining their situation as women in their relationships and as a couple and with men in work and all this. So all of a sudden uh, people got it, but people really got it a few years later, especially the women's movement, the early women's movement and the women's filmmaking uh, industry. Did, did she then, uh, do you believe that, that she uh, made this film Lee Girls, then, as you're describing it, was her idea, or did you, do you think that she uh, intended for it to be a political uh, statement, or was it just her? What, what's your assessment of that? I, it, it's a question I always had that I never got an answer from because I never asked it. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't there at the creation. If I had been a witness of its creation in the early 60s. In the mid 60s, yeah, I would have and followed the part that David played and the part that she played. Because David wrote the script. So. Right. So I I don't know, but she once she was granted the honor of being one of the pioneers of the women's lib movement through her film she embraced that because her by then also, I don't know what it was before, but by, she really had a very strong opinion on, and her part in the symposium of women's filmmaking that took place also women's year, 75, in Italy uh, under the auspices of uh, UNESCO. She. Uh, also then really manifested as having really pondered the situation of women in films and women in life and and uh, she she was a great asset uh, uh, at that uh, symposium right so uh, again can we uh, can you describe some of the projects you did work with mm. her on inside the fireplace so, in the evening <laughs> So, um, following um, the Women's Film Festival in Paris, Simone de Beauvoir, who from the 40s had written The, the Second Sex and Le Deuxième Sex, she was, she had, she was a trailblazing, she had trailblazed the, the women's lib movement. And uh, so she, wanted her second sex to become a film. 
And then when she saw what happened at the Women's Film Festival, she asked for a private screening of Les Girls. And uh, so she, um, and at the end, she stood up and she said, I wasn't there, but I was told. She stood up and she said, uh, c'est elle que je veux pour mon film. She's the one I want to do my film, the film of my book. So then the whole ball started rolling and, uh, and phone calls and everything. And she wanted to invite, she invited my, at her house in Paris, in Montparnasse. So and this was when you were with? Right, and I was, yeah, I was working with her, and that encounter I translated both ways again. Do you remember uh, the month and year that was when Simone de Beauvoir invited Mai initially to discuss making a movie of the second sex? Was it the first year you were with her? Or? It was my second year. After, and after the It was after the women's, movie. no, it was after the women's film festival was before the symposium, it was in between the two. Simone de Beauvoir wrote in Le Monde, according to my autobiography, all the images have multiple dimensions in this film. The theatrical scenes reflect real life. Ironic and comic, this film moves us by the beauty of its landscapes, its poetry, and above all, its subtle tenderness. Can I read it? I'm visual. <laughs> so there was, I think for me, it's one of my memories of the most extraordinary encounter was these two icons, I mean, these two great beings of women in the world, you know. So she and, called uh, the, she called the she, house. Well, we didn't have a phone, but <laughs> I was going to ask, it yeah. sort of went around and went through the uh, the people of the festival, and they got back in touch, and and uh, and finally there was an appointment fixed uh, at the house. And you traveled to Paris. And we went to Paris from Nîmes, and uh, and uh, and I I'll never forget how nervous Mai was, yeah. you know, and so she was shaking at the door and. And the door opened, and I saw Simone de Beauvoir. Oh, they were two petite women, and Simone de Beauvoir was also n impressed by my zetteling. It was like a mutual admiration society with stage fright meeting. It was it was very strange, and I was totally cool because I was just a translator, like I was a witness, and I translated English to my and French to Simone de Beauvoir. And then we walked in, and Simone de Beauvoir was so wanting to relax and makes us make us relaxed. And she, there is a little spiral staircase going to the mezzanine, and she sat in the stairs instead of sitting on a couch or in a chair. And there were books everywhere, you know. That contrary to my my set at Le Mas de Gavi, where I couldn't let my the book I was reading anywhere. There were piles of books on the floor, in the stairs, and... Uh, so Simone the, de Beauvoir's home was not a film set? And there was not a film set. It was a, a, definitely a researcher's set, though. I mean, you could see how much she, she was very... Uh, was she considerably older than my Zetterling at that time? Did you? Uh, age, I'm, uh, I'm, not a, yeah. I'm not conscious of age, so I don't okay. know. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, but I always thought Mai was older than me, so is, yeah. so they they were both older, so I didn't see a difference between them. So we left with the book, and and the idea was to come back with a project to uh, Simone de Beauvoir. And. Um, and at that time, we did a lot of goat herding. We'd, we had to do it the whole day for some reason. So I would do, let's say, the morning, and Mai would do the afternoon, and we would do it with the book, and just sit in the, in, in the lawn somewhere and watch the goats, and, uh, and just read the book. And, tr and, and in the evening, the biggest flash I remember from Mai was that each chapter 
would be done from a different continent. And all of a sudden, you know, it became global. It this was is her vision. Her of vision of, set. yeah. So we started writing each chapter and choosing the countries and choosing the stories. And Can you give us some examples? Which countries? No, I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but I just remember the, the development. And then, uh, then I remember it just fizzled out. What I remember is that the producer who was supposed to put the money in it, uh, did not come up with the money, and it just stopped. How, That's how, how I long remember. How did you work on that uh, second sex? A few weeks or a few oh, months? months? Months. Months. Yes. yes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, it it was coming so close, and there were so many. Like I, I found one of the projects that I was working on. Uh, Mai wanted me to do La Trame Sonore, the soundtrack. Uh, they were using different women f filmmakers to do different scenes in, in the south of France, and she had chosen a woman who was in her 90s and, and did a lot of farming and collecting the eggs and, and this and that. And I was supposed to do the soundtrack, and I never know how it ended, but it never got done. So finally, my uh, had to go back to uh, I think the first project that she did that worked was in Sweden. And in Sweden, her assistant was still her assistant, a Swedish assistant. And I couldn't speak the language. And, and so slowly and slowly I sort of went back after doing the women's film uh, symposium. With the women out of Athos. Interesting. <laughs> uh, how old were you when you began working for my uh, That was I was forty in seventy-five, so I was probably thirty-nine, thirty-eight uh, when I started. But. And then, and she was fifty, so yeah. you were contemporaries basically. Yeah. The same age. Yeah. Ten, ten years same. difference, but it seemed like a lot to me at the time. Yeah. Because I was quite impressed with her relationship with Glenn. I thought he looked so he was so young so at the you time. So you knew Glenn Grappene, her her lover of ten years. Right. Uh, he met when I don't know how they met, but he appeared first at Le Mas de Guivre before she bought the other place, and uh, so and then she took him with her to renovate the new house, and I was sliding out. Can you tell us uh, some details about the UNESCO Women in Cinema International Seminar in Italy? Uh, anything you remember about Yes, I have. Um, uh, I would like to sh uh, look at my notes um, because it it was it, it was so well organized. It was so well done. And it, the women filmmakers came from all over the world. They came from India, from Russia. There was uh, there was B. B. Anderson, and um, oh, good, I have it here. So, and there was um, there was Agnès Varda from France, there was Chantal Ackerman from Belgium, but there were people from all over, all over the world. And um, so there was um, a document drafted collectively by the participants in the International Symposium. So by the women filmmakers. By, yeah, women in cinema held at Saint Vincent. That was 23rd to the 27th of July, 75. So uh, the 28 women filmmakers present here at Saint Vincent have spent four days together. We find that we have not only produced resolutions and official texts, um, however, our criteria of efficiency are different from those official international meetings. We are not delegates of our respective countries. That was what I was most impressed with, the individualities fell down, the egos seemed to meld. 
Uh, we have, right from the beginning of this symposium, chosen to promote the exchange of ideas outside of official and national contexts. We refuse prestige, political takeovers, and false seriousness. We feel that this meeting demonstrates the true image of the solidarity of women since its participants chose to communicate on the basis of their specific personal experiences. We have a double, like most women, we live a double oppression, class oppression plus sexist oppression. So there was this whole uh, draft, this whole document was drafted and, uh, and it, was, it was quite amazing too. And then they drafted the statutes of the International Foundation. Uh, the name of the association, they founded an association which was called Women Images International. And uh, it was registered in Stockholm. I don't know if it had anything to do with my... And the members uh, will be women uh, working other women or uh, women's organization, national or international, which adhere to the present statutes. Uh, the object of the said association is to support, promote, and channel all films made by women which analyze feminine stereotypes and which create a new and truer image of women by denouncing discriminatory attitudes on the grounds of sex and sexist practices in all the media. And it goes on and on. So it was a very, very powerful, very powerful uh, get-together. And the, each woman uh, brought so much. Uh, it, it was, and Mai was really the leader. I mean, she was really the respect around her. The president was uh, Marie Pierre Herzog. She was the director of the whole symposium. In her country, of Herzog. France. She was from France, Herzog. and uh, her brother-in-law was Herzog, the filmmaker. Mm. So she, uh, she, she, was, uh, she was working at UNESCO. She was already a member of UNESCO. We, we uh, have discovered in our research that Mai Zetterling was you know, the, one of the leaders, if not the leader, in terms of trying to accomplish something at that, at that symposium. Yeah, yeah. They've, on a practical basis. Right, right. She really put her heart into it, and uh, she, she, all of a sudden, she seemed to, to have, instead of being Mai Zetterling, the star filmmaker of the w women's years, all of a sudden she was, thank you, she was, um, uh, she had a platform for all this research and thinking and, uh, discoveries she had made through her life and through her career and, and all this. Uh, and she came from so far because she, she was still, she had stigmas from, from the time they brought her to Hollywood. Uh, and what do you mean by stigmas? Well, she realized that they had brought her, but she was, they wanted to make an American blonde, beauty, bombshell. sex object, bombshell, whatever, you know, and uh, she was already there when she realized what they, they were going to do with her, which is totally far from... She even left, I think, um, uh, what, was, what was his name? Uh, Tyrone. Tyrone Power. Power. Tyrone, she used to call him. Tyrone. <laughs> but, uh, I think she really loved him. But it, I think her getting away from what they wanted to do with her was stronger than her love for this man. So she... She left everything. She met Hollywood and she left him. Hollywood. Yeah. Did she speak much about this era of her life? This would be in the early, mid-50s. Yeah, she, she, um, she didn't talk that much about it. She talked how she... She wanted to get away, or what they tried to do with her persona, and if she had stayed there, and... Uh, and what did she say? Had she stayed there, she would have been what? 
She she just didn't want to turn into a, a Marilyn Monroe or, you know, just a sex object. She, and I think she probably, uh, you know, people used to tease her because she had a hippie look and she would, she had these dresses she would get at consignment shops that looked hippie and all this. And I think she, you know, the pendulum, she didn't want her self to be looked at as, as, a, as an object, as a woman's object. So she swung the other direction. <laughs> yeah. But then, when she became a director, all of a sudden she, had a, she could express herself, her mind, her intellect, her, her views, her, her humor, you know, everything that, that she was so powerful. And she loved to write, and she, she knew she had a gift for writing. She always said that uh, she was struck by lightning, and that's when her gift for writing happened to her. She used to write with a pencil, and uh, one day she was near a window during a thunderstorm, and she was sharpening with a knife, I think, sharpening the lead, and the, uh, the pencil got struck, or the knife and the lead got struck. So she said that she came out of there uh, having the gift of writing it. I don't know, it bolted that was something. During, <laughs> That's that was a, during the filming of Loving Couples, I believe, when she and David were uh, staying in the mansion where they filmed Loving Couples, and there was a metal rod on the outside of the wall, just outside that window uh -huh. where she stood sharpening <laughs> the pencil, and that metal rod was stuck, struck by lightning, and it came inside, <laughs> hit the knife, and went up her arm. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> Sheila Lafarge told us yesterday that that was the second time she'd been struck by lightning, that she, she was struck by lightning another time as well. I don't remember that. In Iceland when they made a documentary. Ah, said, I see, I and, see. Uh, and uh, Joe Batterham, her friend and assistant, after you worked for her, told us that uh, there was a period of time when everywhere she went, fires started. Yeah, that uh, that uh, that is possible. Yeah. So, uh, did did you ever see any evidence of this uh, bewitching quality, <laughs> <laughs> or her, or, she, um, or, or or the paranormal gravitating towards she, her? She she. Um, she wanted, she, she wanted to share it with me, uh, and uh, I didn't go there that much. Uh, if you look at the photos of what, what I looked like at the time, I had long hair and sometimes I would put two braids. And um, so apparently, uh, there was an aura around me of American Indian. And uh, people, when they look at those photos, they say, you look American Indian. And uh, she often, like I remember once we were visiting the caves at Le Mas, at Belvezet. There were some caves in the mountains at the, f at the bottom of her property. And, uh, and if she would turn quickly like this, she'd, she'd have a vision. And she always saw me as an Indian. And then we would go to London, and she always wanted to see uh, psychics in London. Yeah. There, yeah. So, uh, and uh, I remember some psychics uh, talking about I was surrounded by American Indians. So, so she she would see a headband on my forehead, and like she, I think she had. I don't know if it was the lightning or what, but she did have some opening in that direction. But um, I didn't see that. She also mentioned that uh, one day she was driving back, like she, she was in the car driving back to La Mas from somewhere, and she heard my voice. She would hear my voice talk to her, and uh, she would tell me about it afterwards. But it wasn't something big uh, that, yeah. Just I think she was, life. she had, yeah, she had some opening and, uh, yeah.
<laughs> do you do you know the film that, that she went to work on in Sweden? No. I know that uh, the, her assistant came to Le Mas and they worked on it. She was Swedish, but... Uh, Britta Workmaster. Yeah, Britta, Britta. Britta. I remember that name now, yeah. Britta Workmaster. Yeah. Right. She always was the production assistant yeah. on the Swedish films. Right, right. So we were talking that she, um, she said it was a difficult time, and, uh, but it was hard for her to express her gratitude as we were going along. Meaning? Well, she wasn't in, she, she, she stayed, she, there was no emotion uh, usually expressed easily. In your working life? In, in, her, uh, in her life. She didn't express, uh, and in 77 she, um, she offered me, uh, as a token of gratitude, she offered me a piece of land near Le Mas, in, near Belvise, on the other side of the village. Small piece of land, just a piece of land, dry land. And, uh, but all of a sudden she had this expression of gratitude, years, two years after I'd left. But I never got the papers. <laughs> <laughs> no, got but, but she so thought of it. She it thought of it. Mind. She expressed it. So she didn't express her, <laughs> her gratitude on a daily basis. But when she thought no, of it, she she, did. she was uh, yeah yeah. Well, she was you know Scandinavian and uh, and she she'd been hurt a lot you know and uh, I don't know what her career was with Bergman or even that the beginning of her career as an actress. She didn't like to talk about it and and the whole family thing you know um like her mother wrote a book about something her mother wrote a book wasn't it a wasn't it her mother who wrote a biography at some point there we're was not a, aware of that no I'm not sure what do you we, we, well, we have talked to others about her relationship with yeah, her mother, but uh, I, I what's, don't, your, what's your fix on that? What's your, what was well, your Well, she, 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 she kept it, you know, under the carpet, everything, the, the mother, the children, you know, we never heard about them. And, uh, but her mother, she, she was very uneasy talking about her mother. You mentioned uh, in our initial telephone conversation that uh, her mother um, objected to her, uh, or not objected necessarily, but looked askance at her relationship with the second wave of feminists and the way they embraced her films as feminists. You said her mother, you got the impression that her mother didn't approve. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. No, you're not sure. <laughs> I was wondering because others have you know, commented on that too. Yeah. You, may, you, you did say you were just speculating on that. Yeah. <laughs> but you, it's hard to know if she never it's talked hard. about she, it. She didn't like to, to open herself up. Tell us about... There was um, one who tried to to get her to talk was Lawrence Darrell. She was very close to, to Lawrence Darrell. He lived near Nîmes, and uh, he used to come over very often. She would invite him to dinner and all this. And, uh, and he would tease her a lot about, uh, you know, what she used to be and what she had become. And he used to say, you that she used to be such a beauty and now she was dressed like a hippie and he would tease her but at the same time I think he managed to pull information from her but uh, Open I, her up and, yeah. yeah she um, it, it, she was surrounded by all the artists and writers of, of Provence which was really fascinating you know she uh, she was known as a great party thrower, did you experience that with her too? I didn't, she wasn't a party, party 
animal at all, as far as I was concerned. She liked to uh, have guests for dinner, she liked to cook, she liked to entertain, but I've, I never saw her uh, throw a party. Like a big party. Yeah. Okay. Or drink, yeah. or, you know, like... She, no. No. She wasn't a drinker. I Wine, but, uh, you know, wine, not, uh, not a party animal at all. Right. Yeah. And can you describe some of the cooking? And did she have a big garden at this home, just as she did in the subsequent home? Uh, it wasn't that big. Um, let me see. What, uh, what is that, that green veggie? Uh, zucchini. She, um, she couldn't control the zucchinis. <laughs> so all of a sudden, the zucchinis just just started multiplying and she'd come with baskets. So her solution to that was to write a cooking book on zucchini, different recipes of zucchini. So she always had a solution to, to everything. So, so for months that when she wrote that cooking book, I don't know if it ever got published or not, but there's, <laughs> I don't know, but she, Every day was a new recipe, and she'd give a new name, and you know we we filed them and uh, tasted them, and so I ate zucchini for months. Have you eaten zucchini since? No, <laughs> never again. <laughs> I think we've all had similar experiences with zucchini. <laughs> but she, uh, you know, she she always had a creative solution to everything. Yeah. Tell us more about Lawrence Durrell and. Uh, it's interesting that you say during the period you were with her that she saw him frequently. Yeah, and I saw him it too. It must have been concentrated in that period of time. Oh, yeah? Possibly, or... Yeah. Um, and he wasn't, he wasn't writing at the time. Like, I, what I remember is, um, is he, he was working more on the French translations of his books. I used to love it because he used to say that his French translator was better than his his original writing. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I noticed that with uh, with my books also. I've written two, three books, and uh, when I see a translation of it, I like it better than what I wrote. I couldn't understand it at the time because I said it's Lawrence Durrell. You know, how can a translator be any better? And he um, he loved coming to Le Mas and uh, spending time with Maya and uh, they were always having great intellectual discussions. It was, it was very interesting. Tell us about uh, the times that you visited her or got together with her or went to her home after you came back from Greece uh, and up to... It was uh, after I finished my training in, in India as a meditation teacher. Uh, there was a book that had been written uh, on meditation that I had started to translate when I was in the Himalayas. And uh, all of a sudden I got a letter which was very surprising from my, in the Himalayas, telling me she had to go, I can't remember if it was Iceland or Greenland, it was a film, one of those two islands that she, ha she was making a film. We're closer to 78, 79 by then. That would be the Of Seals and Men. Documentary. Okay, so I didn't say it. Mm -hmm. So she asked me, she said she always thought of me first to, um, to uh, take care, house sit, take care of Lamas and the animals. So I stopped in London and picked up a friend of mine who was going to help me with the translation and we came on Lamas, but uh, it, sometimes she had already left when I would arrive. Like it, uh, we didn't see that much of her after that. Uh, but before that, she did write me, um, I think it was in 77 when she had that explosion of gratitude. 
And also, she was writing her autobiography, and she wrote me a letter um, she, uh, asking me to, uh, to write in her autobiography. Is this the letter you brought with you? Yeah. Can we get that? Maybe you can read it to us. It's the one that has the creases in it. There we go. Thank you. It's underneath it. Yeah. There it is. So she, um, I like what she says about her autobiography. She says, um, I'm also doing a lot of walking in the autumn woods of the mass that are splendid at the moment. I'm reading a lot and I'm beginning to work on my new big book for Copes in London, an autobiography which I call, and I think Elise, you might possibly approve of that, is the title at least, In the Monkey Cage. So I don't know if that's known, that her working title was In the Monkey Cage in, instead of Those, those, those tomorrows. tomorrows. It's a, it is a big undertaking, but also exciting, of course. But when I think of it, a part of my stomach sinks. Do you understand? I don't want a boring account of my struggle, but something, you see, it's not a boring account of my life. She, she says, a boring account of my struggle. Her life was a struggle. But something that might help others, which also is... Um, then she goes on to say, Elise, I do have something to ask you. I'm going to use some pieces from friends in my book, different witnesses, if you like, different periods in my life. Would you care to like to write as well? I would be very underlined, very happy if you would, as ours is a very special relationship, a spiritual with the guiding hand somewhere in the background. See this, with me she always had this undertone of spirituality, but it was in the background, you know, there's a guiding hand. You see something in me that others don't see. Do you get the idea? You could do it for the new year. What year was that? 79. I think it's 79. Uh, do you get the idea? You could do it for the new year, anything from 2 to 20 pages. Just let it be true to itself. And no flattery, but fondness, I hope. So she viewed her life as a struggle. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in what everything, way? everything that, as I, I've repeatedly said, it's uh, that her work as an actress, her relationship with her mother, the the first marriage, the children, nothing seemed to have upheld time. You know the. Nothing seemed to have, have lasted. So. Right, right. And for her, for her, right. that was a failure of sorts, or I don't think she used the word failure. It's just that it was not easy. Everything was difficult. Difficult. Yeah. She talked to me about Glenn. You want to hear it? Absolutely. <laughs> Glenn is here. He worked very well on the Greenland film, both as sound recording and second camera, and also as assistant editor. So he is learning the business from all ends. He can now get a job in London as an assistant. I'm very glad for that, for him. We are not having too easy a time, you see. It was never easy. But then we never did, really. See, that, that I'm surprised because he, I don't know. I'm deeply fond of him, but it will work itself out somehow. I don't think the relationship will last that long but I hope it can remain friendly. And yet it lasted for a decade. Yeah. Please, please keep in touch. I love you dearly. Keep growing, she tells me. <laughs> so it's probably my, my trips to India. So. so it wasn't your impression that her relationship with Gwen was always difficult? Or well, I, it was... I, I didn't really see much of them, you know, they... That's when the new house started. So he was working on the new house, and I was more 
at the old house. At the old house. So they owned, they owned those homes, or they had those homes simultaneously. For a while, for a while before she sold the mass, yeah. It took a while, yeah. Yeah. Her, um, her novel, uh, is it Bird of Passage? Have you read this novel, no. Bird of Passage? She describes what appears to be the aftermath of her 14-year marriage with uh, David, uh, and also in the 1977 film, We Have Many Names, her description and depiction of her, a woman devastated by a man leaving, or the aftermath of a relationship, is, is just uh, so if, so affecting that it's hard to believe she didn't experience it in real life. She talks about hiding out in a in a hut and crying for days. And, and uh, did you find her that devastated after David left, or had they prepared themselves for this? Point? She wasn't prepared because. I think it was a shock when she learned it in Canada, from what I could see, but um, but I don't... It was probably, see again, it was, she probably kept it inside. I don't, I don't remember her crying, or you see, she probably hid to cry if she cried. Well, she did it on, on film, in, uh, in a movie called We Have Many Names. Oh, okay. <laughs> But the, uh, there was one film script we both worked on. Uh, she was writing the script, and it was what happens to a woman after uh, a s divorce or separation or something. And the, a normal couple, the woman has given up her life. She described a married woman as someone who's given up her life, even her friends. So all the friends become the friends of the husband or the, or the couple. And after the separation, the woman is totally isolated because she doesn't have any more friends. They all, she loses the husband. But, so I, there is naturally somewhere a relationship with, with her life. This was the but at the same time, I didn't have the impression that she had such a social life that she had lost, because she had isolated herself on, in Provence, going to the south of France. I don't know what her life was before in London with her husband. I don't know what it was like, but she, she had gone there with him before isolating herself. So, so it's, uh, I don't know. She wrote about it then, yeah. and made a film about it. Yes. It's a wonderful film, but it's very, very, it's little known. It's yeah. A, but it is a very authentic depiction of the divorce and separation. Yeah. She probably, yeah, it's probably the film that, was, that yeah. we, we worked on and we discussed a lot on the, in the fireplace. Because uh, we worked both on it, yeah. And I, she would write. I would type what she'd written. We'd discuss, and you know, like uh, it was. Uh, but I didn't know what it turned out to be because it was one of those projects that I left and never finished. You know, yeah. No, she did finish that project. Yeah. Yes. I'd be interested to see it. I, That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. I found it fascinating. Uh, toward the end of her life, she did a lot of television. Mm. That's right. That's right, because she came to Quebec City. What was that, that series, American series? The Hitchhiker? The Hitchhiker. She, um, in one of her letters, she says, I even went to that horrible place, Hollywood. She calls it that horrible place. Uh, it's probably, again, remembering what they wanted to do with her when she was in Hollywood. You know, they just typecasted her. And so, um, so The Hitchhiker, she did an episode in my hometown, Quebec City. 
So we did see each other, I don't know what year that was, but that was in the 70s, maybe early 80s, 80s. And um, so I, she, um, I was teaching meditation north of Montreal in, at the time, so, but I went to Quebec, I took some time off and I went to Quebec. And she was so busy filming, so she decided we wouldn't be able to see each other enough. So she um, gave me a walk-on pass, a walk-on roll, uh, figuration in French, we say, a role de figuration. Uh, <laughs> so, so I was, uh, I was just walking through, in and out of rooms and things like that, and uh, but. Every break, every meal, and you know, we we could sit together and catch up. And uh, I was, um, yeah, I I could see that it wasn't her type of. Again, she had. I think she was making a sacrifice to get some money in for probably. The, I think I remember it was the the house, the renovations, and things like that. Because I don't think. The hitchhiker was her cup of tea. No. <laughs> but it was good to see her again in, in those circumstances. It was great. We've watched a lot of the television that she participated in. She also wrote and she directed these episodes of The Hitchhiker and a couple of other episodes of other series. Uh, and uh, she co wrote some of these segments with David Hughes. They got back together. And oh, and for writing? For just for work? They got back together? Yes. I see. Yes. I see. Yes. And uh, they're very interesting stuff for television. Yeah. yeah. So you, was that your only uh, television or film role? <laughs> no, I, I used to be an actress before everything. Were you? Uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. In Canada? In Quebec, yeah. In Quebec. Yeah. <laughs> so you had a resume so she could cast you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I must have been part of the union. So uh, right, the, uh, for walk-ons yeah. you had to be part of so, so it. But it was great to see her again. And, uh, and, but I, I wasn't, I didn't write, we didn't have a correspondence, which I regretted in some sort of way. I would get one or a letter or two. but. Um, and then I found out when she died from, from Joe. Luckily, I had kept in touch with Joe, Josephine. Right. And uh, I nearly deleted her email because of the name Josephine. I'd never heard it. Joe was Joe for me. Like, I, I never knew a Josephine in my life. <laughs> so I'm glad we connected again. But so that's how I found out that she had died. Of cancer. Yeah. I'm not surprised she died from cancer because somebody who struggles all the time, even her dog died of cancer, Keeper. Did he? He used to sit on a mound outside the house looking down the three kilometers of road all day long waiting for her and she was away so much and especially after 75 when I I would be house sitting. That meant she was away filming somewhere, and uh, so that dog was at uh, this longing. This he was really, really missing her, mm. and he died of cancer. And 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 you would connect that to her emotional struggle. Well, somewhat. Some for me. Uh, People who keep inside their struggles and their grief and, you know, they, it's like a cancer inside, we say, that's an expression. And, uh, 